The UK's Defence Industrial Strategy, a 44-minute presentation held in the Joint Services Command and Staff College, Shrivenham, on the 26th of February, 2009. The speaker is Professor David Kirkpatrick. Let me say two things first by way of introduction. First, anything I say today does not necessarily represent the views of the Ministry of Defence that I used to work for, University College London that I worked for somewhat later, uh, or indeed uh, Cranfield University with whom I'm uh, a visiting professor. The second thing I'll draw your attention to if you're interested in acquisition issues is this handy little textbook which was called Conquering Complexity, Lessons for Defence Systems Acquisition, written by myself and my colleagues at UCL. And if you think that's just another author searching for royalties, I can assure you that the royalties go not to the authors, but to the Soldiers, Sailors and Airmen's Families Association, a charity chosen by Sir Jeremy Blackham, who kindly wrote the introduction for us. So I consider myself entitled to wave it about at every convenient opportunity, and I count this such an opportunity. Today I'm going to spend some time talking about the defence industrial strategy. I'm going to cover alternative strategies for defence acquisition, just to remind you that there is not one single way of doing this, and not one particular way is correct at all times and all places. And I'll talk a little bit about the features of the global defence market, which make it a particularly challenging task. I shall refer to the evolution of MOD policy since World War II and then focus on the defence industrial strategy itself, published under the guidance of Lord Drayson in December 2005. Then I shall devote most of my talk to the challenges which the defence industrial strategy faces. And in this part of the talk, I may sound rather critical and sceptical, that isn't because I regard it as an easy problem. It isn't because I have little respect for the very talented people who are trying to run defence acquisition problems, but it is the function of academics to ask the awkward questions rather than necessarily being expected to come up with the answers. I will talk a little bit about the MOD industry rapprochement, which will be necessary in order to make the defence industrial strategy a success and indicate progress towards through-life capability management. Let's look at the alternative strategies. What can a government that wants to buy defence equipment from its armed forces do? It has several ways. It can have government-owned and managed establishments, factories, dockyards. This approach has a great history going right back to the French galley shipyards that were established on, on the Seine in medieval times. Whenever defence equipment is very different from that being produced for the civil market, there has to be uh, government establishments to provide it because the civil market will not. Alternatively, you can have private contractors operating onshore. And I include within this category Contractors that are foreign-owned may even be foreign-managed, but conduct a large proportion of their defence business in the UK. A lot of their activity is UK-based. And in MOD speak, these are titled British companies. So Boeing UK, Thales, Lockheed Martin, all these organisations are counted as British companies. Or indeed, it can buy from private contractors abroad. It can buy from people who are based in foreign countries and have no particular link other than a trade link with the UK and simply provide the information requested. Or there are various alternative hybrid arrangements. You can buy through uh, public-private partnerships. You can buy where the, some of the suppliers of the equipment and its other lines of development are state controlled and some of them are government controlled. You can have multinational consortia where you may have a whole variety of British and foreign companies mixed together. You can have government owned contractor operated establishments, what the Americans call GOCO, where the government uh, pays the investment, owns the plant but it is managed with private sector efficiency by a private contractor. And all these options have different levels of cost and different levels of security of supply. It is claimed 
though I don't think it's ever been actually proved, that royal dockyards and royal ordnance factories and so forth are chronically inefficient because they're protected from the market and therefore that is a costly way to go. Buying stuff from abroad is, uh, does not offer the same security of supply because a foreign contractor is subject to his own commercial imperatives and indeed to the imperatives of his government and may not be prepared to supply uh, equipment as and when the Ministry of Defence wants it. And the relative advantages of the various options that I've, I've pointed to there uh, depend on the type of defence equipment considered. Clearly, things like missiles are in a different category from things like boots and bullets. And it also depends on the nation's economic, military and technological environment. There are some nations which simply do not have the industrial base to supply the defence equipment that they need and therefore they have to buy it from abroad. There are nations which do not have the resources to buy some of the defence equipment available. Let me remind you of the features of the global market for defence equipment, which is indeed very different from most markets with which you will be familiar. First of all, there are large economies of scale. That is to say, if you produce large quantities of an equipment, you're able to produce it more economically than if you produce small quantities. Things are cheaper by the dozen. Things are even cheaper by the gross. This means that countries which serve the United States market can achieve economies of scale by having long production runs which drive down cost. And there are barriers to entry. Barriers to entry refers to markets which it is difficult for anybody with a white van and a set of tools to break into. To break into the defense market, a company has to have sufficient knowledge of that market, a sufficient technological uh, database, sufficient facilities, sufficient contacts with the military establishments that it's trying to sell to. It is very difficult for small uh, companies to break into the defense market. And there are very large timescales from concept to entry into service. People deplore this regularly. Uh, people say, why can't the military buy stuff as quickly as civilians? Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that, and I don't want to go into them now because that would take us off along a branch line or a long detour. Let us simply observe that there are long gaps between concept and entry into service, 10 to 20 years generally. And that means that the, many of the things that a private contractor would do in the commercial market, like investment up front and marketing and so forth, simply do not apply. There is such a long gap. There's no way in which private sector money could fund the development of a battleship or an aircraft carrier or a combat aircraft in the hope of selling it to some air forces afterwards. There are significant risks involved in defense projects. Significant risks to performance, cost, and time scale. Why are there significant risks? Well, there are significant risks because defense equipment has to be at the forefront of technology. It has to be at the forefront of technology because if it isn't, it'll be outclassed on the battlefield by stuff that is. And therefore, if any Ministry of Defense were to take a very conservative line and only approve for acquisition stuff which had all the risks removed from it, this would, it would certainly be obsolete when it entered service and would be uh, inferior to other equipment in, in, in the field. So the projects have to be launched while they still contain significant risks and those risks have to be managed effectively. There are constraints imposed by public accountability. The Ministry of Defence, like other uh, public sector organisations, is constrained by a set of rules, which means it cannot do things which might be cost-effective in procurement, but which would be, if not actually illegal, inappropriate for government bodies to indulge in. There are a limited number of potential customers. If you're producing a major piece of defense equipment, you can probably count uh, your potential customers on the fingers of one foot. No, but it's not very many. And furthermore, they change their minds. 
They change their minds not only because the circumstances in which they are diplomatic and geostrategic circumstances in which they're operating change, but individuals change. Senior officers move on. Politicians move on. There can be a uh, significant impact on a nation's procurement plans over the space of the 15, 20 years or so it takes to bring a project into service because of the changing scene. So that means that a a defense contractor wishing to produce defense equipment for the market cannot do market surveys in the same way that a private contractor would do. He cannot go out and look at a thousand customers representing the million customers that he might have and say, do you like black cars or red ones or do you like automatic or gear change or or, or manual uh, and get a reply and operate on that basis. It's just not possible within the defense field. There are large fluctuations in demand and the most obvious large fluctuation is from peace to war. You don't want very much and suddenly you want a lot. That's a big fluctuation in demand. But there's also fluctuations in peace as the emphasis in the defense budget switches from submarines to aircraft to armored vehicles and round again. So the demand on a particular company with a particular sort of expertise goes up and down even in peacetime and, of course, even more in war. And the final bullet is that there are several groups of interested stakeholders in the UK and abroad There are the services themselves, there's British industry, there's the research establishments, there are politicians, there are trade unions, and abroad there are foreign governments whose security depends on what we do as much as ours depends on what they do, allies. Um, There are interest groups who are bothered about nuclear weapons or some other sort of weapon. All these people pile in and insist on making their voices heard on issues of defense acquisition. And some of them can make their voices heard quite strongly. They all feel that they have a right to be heard and have a right to influence policy. Some of these considerations, of course, are shared by other public sector organizations. Organizations like the health service have uh, some of these features. Similarly, there are some private areas of the market which suffer from some of these features, but I believe that only defense is affected by them all, and therefore it represents a particularly difficult problem. This defense market, accordingly, is very imperfect. There are perfect markets, uh, beloved uh, economists. This market is imperfect. It cannot be managed according to the nostrums of elementary textbooks in economics, which is probably all that senior service officers, I mean, people much more senior than yourselves, have read and perhaps politicians as well. In this market, a defense contractor can only operate satisfactorily if he's got some sort of comparative advantage, if he's got some sort of advantage relative to other contractors in the same business, or if he's supported by his host government. The sort of comparative advantages that I'm talking about include things like a large home market, which may be protected in some sort of way by government policy, or low labor cost, that's an advantage enjoyed by some people in the less developed countries, or superior expertise sustained by research. If a contractor really has the edge in some particular niche, then they can survive in the global market, provided they keep ahead of everybody else. Government support can be provided, and it can be a mixture of all sorts of things. It can be preferential purchasing at higher prices, the sort of thing which says we will buy our equipment from a British company rather than a foreign one, even if it costs 15% or 25% or 50% more. And some governments run such a policy. Or there can be government-funded research and development projects. Traditionally, in the UK, much research and development work was done in the research establishments funded by government, and the results were provided to industry to help them to develop products. The United States had a similar arrangement and that was supplemented by a subsidy paid to private contractors doing research and development on their own behalf, but which the Department of Defense considered might have some benefit for the United States as well. So that they tended to get a a 40% subsidy, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Or there could be diplomatic and financial support for export. 
politicians love doing this sort of thing. They love going to foreign countries and saying, look what splendid kit we've got, wouldn't you like to buy some? And they can do quite a lot of that, but it doesn't have much effect because countries rarely export more than a small fraction of the equipment that they make for their own use. There are very few exceptions to that rule. The French Mirage is one, the British Hawk is another, but there aren't many. Those exports tend not to create that much support for the home industry. Or it can have an explicit industrial strategy of long-term partnerships and a close relationship between government and industry. The French have long operated a system like that. They call it dirigiste. They consider the boundary between state enterprises and private enterprises to be somewhat blurred. The state has a strong influence on private industry. Private industry has a strong influence on the state. In UK, on the other hand, the development of our acquisition policy has been driven by a number of factors. One of the most important is that the arms race of the 20th century, and for that matter the 19th, have yielded substantial increases in performance of defence equipment of various kinds. And in parallel, there have been real and sustained increases, about 5%, 10% a year for most classes of defence equipment, in the unit cost of most classes. So what nations have been doing is buying smaller fleets less frequently. I talk more about this subject in the presentation I gave a fortnight ago. And because of these effects, industry has consolidated, particularly since the end of the Cold War, when demand for defence goods dropped briefly. The defence industry has consolidated, so there are now many fewer contractors than there were, and these few contractors facing the same number of governments have got greater market power, greater negotiating clout than they had in the old days. In the old days, when I worked for the Ministry of Defence, there were lots and lots of contractors, defence contractors in the UK, who were utterly dependent on MOD for orders. The MOD had the whip hand, which is sometimes used well and sometimes not so well. The situation is very different now. There are relatively fewer, much larger contractors who are much less dependent on MOD business. And you know better than I that the role of UK Armed Forces has changed since the Cold War. We're now no longer defending Western Europe against an identified threat. We're defending uh, national security in a whole variety of ways which involve expeditionary forces in diverse scenarios. Immediately after World War II, British forces relied largely on British equipment. In the 1960s and 70s, it was realized that in some categories that was unaffordable. And in the aircraft business particularly, we engaged in collaborative projects, collaboration between UK government and foreign governments, collaboration at the supplier level between UK firms and foreign firms. And this had the effect of sharing the fixed costs, sharing costs like the development costs of a project. So naturally, it impacted first on those areas where development costs are comparatively large, like aircraft and missiles, as I mentioned. And in those days, the Ministry of Defence Procurement Executive had an explicit responsibility for the welfare and prosperity of the aircraft and electronics industries in the UK. It may not have been terribly successful at promoting the prosperity of the aircraft and electronics industries, but it was written firmly into its terms of reference. It was expected to do that. All that was changed by the advent of Mr Peter Levine, who was appointed Chief of Defence Procurement in the middle of the 80s, and he proclaimed a policy of open competition, open competition, including from abroad. He would buy best value for money wherever it came from. And he believed in firm prices, taught customer contractor relationships and adversarial negotiation between the ministry and industry. He has claimed that this introduction of this policy saved the MOD £1 billion a year, which in those days amounted to about 12% of the procurement budget. Now, although that policy was welcomed by industry at the time, after all, it didn't wish to criticise a Conservative government, which at that period was cracking down on trade unions and making life safe for big business, it was very much inclined to go along with its political bedfellow, and at the same time with its largest customers. So when Mr. Levine said, this is good for you, they all said, yes, of course, sir. 
But over the years, they became disillusioned and they started to criticize this policy of open competition, which they said was wasteful and costly and was in danger of putting British defense industry out of business. And as part of the Strategic Defense Review in 1998, a new policy of, quote, smart acquisition, unquote, was introduced. And smart acquisition went some way towards changing policy. It suggested that rather than having adversarial relationships, the MOD and its chosen supplier could do partnering. And partnering was a cooperative relationship during the life of a project. It meant that once a contractor had been selected, it and the Ministry of Defence both recognised and understood a common interest in the success of the project and agreed to cooperate on bringing it to a satisfactory conclusion rather than being at each other's throats all the time. And the industry was very pleased about this, but it wanted more. The partnering on individual projects was seen rather like a shipboard romance. I'm talking about P&O cruise ships in the old days rather than anything particularly naval. A temporary romance rather than a permanent long-term relationship which, which was what industry wanted. And they lobbied and lobbied and lobbied And Lord Drayson, who of course had come from industry himself, was convinced and he drove through the publication of a defence industrial strategy in December 2005, which effectively reversed Levine policy completely and inaugurated strategic partnerships between government and some chosen contractors. These strategic partnerships would extend over many projects not only over several projects going on at the same time, but over projects and their successors. So it was a long-term alliance between government and industry. Now let's describe a few things about the Defence Industrial Strategy, just in case not everyone has read it as carefully as they should. It defines three categories of equipment. There's one category which is available from several stable trading partners and therefore the MOD has no strategic interest in retaining any onshore capabilities whatsoever. This includes, for example, aero engines. And it doesn't exclude the idea that there may not be in UK some economic reason for maintaining a capability in aero engines. But it says that the Ministry of Defence is not particularly interested in aero engines per se. There's a second category of equipment which is available from trusted allies, but which the MOD can buy from abroad, but it wants to retain the onshore capability for upgrade, maintenance and repair. So it's saying, yes, we don't necessarily wish to have onshore capability in design and production for this equipment, but we do want to be able to look after it and mend it and use it without having to refer back to the original supplier. And this is called appropriate sovereignty. And finally, there's a category which includes warship systems for which MOD will sustain all capabilities on shore, but may buy abroad in particular cases. One of the remarkable things about this particular thing is that whereas warship systems are something that it wants UK to retain capability in, it is prepared to buy individual hulls from overseas if the overseas supplier offers particularly good value for money. It has, nevertheless, to maintain warship building capability in the UK as part of the objectives of the strategy. Defence Industrial Strategy 2005 accepted a strategic responsibility to sustain onshore those technological and industrial capabilities to support the chosen sets of projects. And this means that in future, MOD decisions on the acquisition of equipment are not only based on military and financial considerations, but also depend on economic and industrial development considerations. The whole decision-making box has been enlarged considerably. I will say that at cabinet level, such uh, considerations were always present. When the Ministry of Defence made a decision on purely military and financial terms, that decision could be overturned in cabinet if there were overriding social or economic reasons 
for taking a, a, a different line. But now that particular bit of decision making is built in at MOD level for strategic reasons. And to sort of re-emphasizing what I've said already, appropriate sovereignty requires onshore expertise in many areas. If you want appropriate sovereignty in a particular military capability, then you need several projects combined to deliver that capability. For each project, you may need several technologies and several sorts of industrial capacity. So in order to sustain a particular military capability, you need quite a broad base of onshore technological and industrial facilities to back it up. And it's not just the equipment, of course, that you're concerned with. Military capability involves not just the equipment, but the other lines of development covered by the acronym TEPIDOIL. And if you want to sustain that military capability with appropriate sovereignty, you have to sustain all those other lines of development as well. And that expertise is scattered around. Some of it's in service branches, some of it's in individual contractors up and down the country. Quite a lot of it is concentrated in the few large contractors with which the MOD might have a strategic alliance. Uh, but there's a lot of other it scattered around as well, which means that the ministry has got to take account of all these suppliers which feed down the supply chain and which ultimately provide that military capability. And that again is a reversal of the Levine policies because Levine policy said the Ministry of Defence is very bad at managing projects. It should hand it all over to a chosen prime contractor and that chosen prime contractor will be responsible for choosing subcontractors and making arrangements with them and so on and so on. The Ministry of Defence does not want to know about that. So complex military, financial and industrial effects. Let's now look at some of the challenges to defence industrial strategy. The first, and in some ways the most serious challenge, is to develop a rationale. Defence industrial strategy is presented as a, this is what we are going to do. It doesn't say why we are going to do it. It doesn't say that it's the best of all possible options. It's an order. It's come out like white smoke from the Vatican. And that has not necessarily convinced people in the boiler rooms, in the industry, in the services, in the civilian branches of the Ministry of Defence, that it is any better than any of the other initiatives which come thick and fast and are claimed to improve defence acquisition. And it's also got to show that this concept of appropriate sovereignty actually means something. Is it worth spending a lot more money to have the defence equipment entirely based in UK when we are not applying the same strategy to food or energy or lots of other things, but the effects of which would be disastrous if our supplies were cut off even for a few months. Does it actually matter? In the latest Russi Defence Systems, there's an article from Lewis Page who says that appropriate sovereignty is complete rubbish. There is so much foreign equipment of various kinds, components, whatnot, in almost all UK equipment now and in the foreseeable future that we will never be able as a nation to operate totally independently with sovereignty over our entire fleet. You can read what he has to say, but it's certainly a convincing argument. The second challenge that the defence industrial strategy faces is to demonstrate that it's got momentum, that it can survive the changes in the personnel involved particularly that it can survive the departure of Lord Drayson, who has gone off to play with motor cars, and whether it can be carried through, because it's one thing to come up with a strategy, it's another actually to implement it. Top-level political commitment is essential, but it's not sufficient. We had plenty of top-level political commitment during smart acquisition. I heard everyone from Lord Robertson down proclaim what a splendid thing smart acquisition was, but several years later, Sir Peter Spencer, in testimony to the House of Commons Defence Committee, admitted that it simply had not been implemented. The plan was there, but nobody had done it. So keeping up momentum is a problem. You'll see in the Defence Equipment Report, which was published today, that industry and MOD have very different views on how it's going. MOD thinks it's going splendidly. Industry thinks it's dead in the water, or words to that effect, on hold. 
And the delay in publishing the second version of the Defense Industrial Strategy has eroded confidence. It was planned that a second and more definitive document would follow after the first one. It was accepted that the first one was done in, a great, in great haste, and it left some holes, it left some ambiguities. There was need for some development and clarity of the ideas. That document was scheduled for December 2006, and there's still no sign of it. And the ministry doesn't seem at all convinced that it's actually ever going to appear. There are more challenges. It's going to be necessary to negotiate stable uh, yet flexible partnership agreements. And so far, uh, of all the things which the Defence Industrial Strategy intended to do, there has been much more success in planning and reorganisation than on achieving agreements. Some of the milestones that the Defence Industrial Strategy put forward for itself to meet was start negotiations. And it's able to say, yes, we've started negotiations. That isn't a lot of help. You have to finish negotiations to get anywhere. It has to develop a method of regulating strategic partnerships. These suppliers, BAE Systems, any other major supplier that they might choose, will be essentially monopolies. And you have monopoly-monopsony relationships which are difficult to regulate. We have considerable experience in the UK of regulating monopoly suppliers for the public sector, but in fact, defence presents some additional complications. And it's by no means clear that the ministry has thought through how these defence strategic partnerships might be regulated. And if we are going to have autonomous onshore capabilities for repair, maintenance and upgrade, we have to persuade foreign suppliers of equipment to pass over to us to transfer sufficient technology so that UK companies can undertake the work. Now, foreign companies generally make sales in the expectation that there's going to be a substantial amount of quite lucrative upgrade and support and repair and maintenance work and so forth going downstream. They may not be keen to give that up. They may not be keen to transfer technology to potential competitors. Even if the commercial companies abroad agreed, their governments might not. So the success of the defence industrial strategy depends to some extent on the MOD's ability to persuade offshore contractors to pass over this technology. And a major, major serious hole in the defence industrial strategy as published is failure to consider the costs. What extra on the defence budget will implementing this strategy actually cost? Well, there's the partial removal of competition, for one thing. Remember Mr. Levine's estimate that he'd save 12% on the procurement budget? Well, you take back even half of that, say 6%, on the present 16% equipment budget. It's a billion pounds, extra billion pounds on the budget. Is that going to be sustainable? There's diseconomies of small scale of onshore support. If we have a foreign piece of equipment, uh, like a Hercules, for example, which was being supported by Lockheed in the US, they'd be doing it as part of a major program of uh, upgrade and support and so forth, and it would be comparatively cheap. If we insist on having an onshore contractor do it, relatively low rate, relatively small scale, but yet all the tooling, all the manuals, all the training necessary um, will suffer increased costs. There's a compensation for foreign suppliers transferring the technology. Any foreign supplier who's told you sell us this equipment, but you are not getting any support work downstream, may well want to jack up the price a bit to compensate himself against the loss of this work. And finally, there's the problem of how much will it cost to sustain UK technological and industrial capabilities between projects. Projects come some distance apart these days. Are we going to have to have a system where you build nuclear submarines and throw them away, whether you want them or not? If not, what? How does one keep these capabilities in place and have sufficient confidence that they are in place? Even more challenges. How do you retain intelligent customer capability in the MOD while at the same time, avoiding duplication in project management. If you're 
partnering with someone if you trust them implicitly and you're giving them responsibility? Do you want to retain the same level of oversight and supervision that you had before? And can you save a bit of money that way? But if you do, is that going to cost you ability to scrutinize for what they're doing and to be an intelligent customer? And an enormous challenge, which I don't even begin to understand, how you can identify and exploit the synergies that come across technologies and across industrial capabilities that can be used for one thing or the other and can feed across into different projects and feed up into different capabilities. The defense industrial strategy and the defense technology strategy sort of strive to do this, but they identify the, uh, the problem and the issue rather than coming up with hard and fast answers. And how do you identify and exploit the synergies between uh, defense acquisition and other government industrial and regional policy objectives? I had three slides of challenges. Lord Drayson, in testimony to the House of Commons Defense Committee, admitted that these were all quite difficult things. I wouldn't disagree with that for a moment. <laughs> Let's talk for a few minutes about the ministry, industry, rapprochement. If you're to have these two bodies, which are quite different animals, working to different imperatives, marching to different drums with different cultures, if you're going to have them working closely together in the future, what are you going to need? Well, you're going to need transparency, mutual trust. There's an enormous literature on collaboration between different organizations and what it takes to make it work. And one of the things, one of the very important things, which is important at the domestic scale, is at the industrial scale, is honesty. Are industry prepared to be honest with government? Is government prepared to be honest with industry? Even if it is, to what extent can decision makers bind their successors? If I promise faithfully that I'm going to support a particular industrial consortium building warships for me, and I change my mind, Ten years later, about what warships I actually need, have I been dishonest? Or am I just being flexible? There's a great difficulty about achieving sufficient transparency. And the same thing works, of course, the, the, the other way. Uh, when these major programs are negotiated, they're conducted within a blizzard of disinformation and special pleading. Industry claiming that dire consequences will happen if it doesn't get this order and it get it now and government claiming that, oh, well, it's, it's open-minded about it, and it hasn't, hasn't really decided yet. There has to be an acceptance that all organizations need to change their culture. The ministry seems to be prepared to change its culture, but it's not quite sure how to do it. You get acres of stuff on the importance of culture change. You get very little on how culture change is actually to be achieved. Industry has not really accepted, it seems to me, that it needs to change its culture at all. Read the uh, testimony in the recently published equipment report and you will see industry people banging on directly about their need for guaranteed large orders, no cutbacks. There is, there is not even a scintilla of understanding or ability perhaps to see that the government is in a difficult position and may need some help. And of course, industry is operating not only in the UK market, but in lots of other markets where the culture hasn't necessarily changed and it will need to retain the same culture that it's always had before in dealing with, with those markets. But there needs to be an even greater appreciation of the nature of risk in the defense environment. People understand in the civil sector that there are things which, which are risky. Uh, maybe the nuclear industry and the offshore oil industry have got risks of corresponding magnitude but the defense industry really has some pretty severe ones which need special handling. And, very important, you need broader education of all the stakeholders involved. It is a lamentable feature of the UK educational system that we tend to come up through stovepipes. We come up a military stovepipe, we come up a political stovepipe, we come up an industrial stovepipe, we may come up a, a scientific and techn technology stovepipe. All our friends and contacts are within that milieu. We talk in the language that they understand. It may be a language of words, it may be a, a language of numbers, it may involve a considerable amount of jargon, it may have entirely different attitudes to obedience and responsibility and indeed honesty. There are very different stovepipes 
and they have a very limited understanding of what goes on in the other stovepipes, and therefore a very limited ability to empathize with and to cooperate with people from other environments. So I would like to see people in government, people in commerce, people in the military, given a much broader education and given a much better understanding of the challenges which their counterparts face. And it's motherhood and apple pie to say there must be agreed goals, agreed goals for the program, clear roles for the partners, mutual respect, constructive ways of resolving differences. If you have to turn to the contract, you've failed. There is a very successful company in the U.S., which whenever it has a problem with one of its industrial partners, doesn't go for the contract, doesn't sit down with the wet towel and the schedule of risks, it enlists some relationship counsellors because it has discovered that very often, in fact the vast majority of times, the problems are between people, individuals, or the cultures that they come from. And that if you can sort out the people problems, you're three quarters of the way there to solving whatever else is going on. Willingness to listen and learn, and of course praise for some small successes. Give more praise, but that's uh, leadership speak, management speak, you know that better than I do. Towards through life capability management. How do you get towards through life capability management? Well, good project management in accordance with smart acquisition policies and enabling acquisition change policies. Kill the conspiracy of optimism, if at all possible. The conspiracy of optimism is where the contractor who's desperate for the contract and the military officer who's desperate for extra capability conspire together to delude the unfortunate taxpayer and his representatives that they can buy this aircraft or this aircraft carrier or something else for only about what half what it's actually going to cost. Therefore, it's good value for money, isn't it? And it gets into the program. And if everybody's doing this, it is a recipe for continuous tension within the MOD budget and continuous short-term dysfunctional corrections trying to get it right. Resist counterproductive initiatives. If, some, if somebody comes up with a clever plan that sounds superficially good, but you know it's flawed, don't just salute and say, yes, sir, we'll implement that. Challenge it, because many, many of these initiatives that come along are, by their very nature, inadequately thought through and do more harm than good. Need to fund research and technology. You will see in the Defence Equipment Report that has been published today, the uh, committee is deploring the fact that the MOD has cut its research spending, whereas other nations are sustaining their defence spending, or in the case of the United States, boosting it enormously. You cannot hope to launch successful projects without a substantial technology base in order to provide the confidence that projects can be launched and carried through successfully. And you need to derive through life costs, through life profiles of cost and capability against changing threats, changing economic circumstances, and use these in order to make trade-offs between performance time and cost as the project goes through in order to get best value for money. So, concluding. Defence market has many special features. Circumstances change and policies have to evolve accordingly. The defence industrial strategy faces several challenges. Establish credibility, maintain momentum, negotiate and regulate strategic partnerships, arrange technology transfer from foreign suppliers and their governments, evaluate budgetary impact of what it's going to cost and how to retain intelligent customer capability, and exploit the synergies for joined up acquisition. And you need good rapprochement between government and industry, and you need to implement through life capability management. Please note that any views expressed in this presentation are entirely and solely those of the speaker, and do not necessarily reflect the official thinking and policy of their organisation, Her Majesty's Government, or the Ministry of Defence.